Well, we are in chapters 4 through 7 of Revelation tonight, and uh, this is part 4 in our series. Last week with Ed Nelson was sort of a little parenthesis, talking about some of the Hebraic aspects uh, of this book. But tonight we are in part 4, and the title of this section, I've titled it, you might think of a better title, but this is just what came to me as I studied the material. Heaven is in control. I think that's what we learned from chapters 4 through 7, although we could really apply that to the entire book, but especially in these chapters. And if you have your notes, you can follow along. I'm going to read a little bit, and then we will actually go into the scriptural text itself, make some comments from that. But I want to provide a summary or a, um, an introduction before we actually delve into the Scripture. And that's in your notes tonight. Okay, so having addressed the needs of His church in those letters that we saw in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus now turns His attention to events that will occur at the end of the church age. And in this section, we will see activities in heaven that initiate events on earth. So the message of these chapters is clear. Heaven is in control. And the first thing we're going to look at is the activity in heaven, chapters 4 and 5, that will affect what happens on earth. Before showing John the horrific calamities about to be visited upon the earth, the Lord lifts him into the heavenly throne room. He says, in fact, that he is caught up in the spirit and he has this vision of the throne of God. The amazing sights and sounds of that vision are the subject of chapters 4 and 5. Some people who study Revelation see in chapter 4, verse 1, a possible reference to the rapture of the church. Here's the way it reads. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. This might suggest that the rapture will end the present church age and initiate the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is that time when God completes His dealings with the people of Israel and also begins His ultimate judgment on the nations. We'll talk a little bit more about the rapture and where it might come in this as we go along. I have tried to underscore the idea that there are different ways of interpreting Revelation as indeed much of Scripture. And people place the rapture at different points along this timeline that I've drawn up here on the board. Um, and so this is my interpretation. And I don't claim uh, to be infallible in that. I don't claim this is the only way to interpret Revelation, it is one way, and uh, since I'm doing the teaching, then I'll use my interpretation. But I want to allow you the freedom and flexibility to uh, differ with me and see it uh, from a different uh, perspective, and that's perfectly okay. As I have said, I don't think God intends anybody to get Revelation all figured out. I think He intentionally left something of a veil over this book, there is a mystery about it, and the best we can do is to look through a glass darkly. And sometimes the images are a little bit fuzzy, cloudy, or distorted, blurry, out of focus. So we do our best to kind of put the pieces together and understand what the Lord is saying to us through it. In chapter 4, John catches a glimpse of the majesty and glory of God's throne. Then in chapter 5, the focus shifts to a scroll held by the one who sits on the throne. Some believe that scroll is the title deed to man's eternal estate, lost by Adam, 
but redeemed by Christ. When God created Adam and Eve and put them in the paradise called the Garden of Eden, a perfect environment, gave them everything their hearts could desire. He intended them to be his co-regents on earth, to express his image and to extend his rule in this planet and to populate this planet with other human beings who would bear that image and share that rule. But unfortunately, as we know, the tempter came along and Adam and Eve fell prey to that and they lost the title deed to that wonderful future uh, that God had in mind for the human family. And so some believe that this scroll that the one who sits on the throne is holding represents all of that wonderful benefit, privilege, future that God had in mind for humanity, but now it's all sealed up. It's sealed with seven seals. What does that suggest to you? It's, it's totally inaccessible. It is sealed so tightly. Seven is the number of perfection or completeness. It's a way of saying to us, there is just no getting at it. There's no access to it. It is forever lost to humanity. And um, John hears the cry, who is worthy? to take the scroll from him who sits on the throne and to break its seals and to open its contents. And no one, he says, was found worthy in heaven or on earth. And at that, John weeps over this incalculable loss. Then he is told not to weep because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed and is worthy to take the scroll and break its seals, thus accessing its contents and restoring man's lost estate. And when John looks up, he sees not a lion, but a lamb still bearing the marks of its slaughter. The lamb takes the scroll, evoking a song of praise from heaven's court to the lamb. We'll see that in just a moment when we get into the text. So this powerful imagery declares the totality of Jesus' redemptive work for humanity and also Jesus' sovereign control over the events that are about to take place. John's vision of heaven reminds the reader to keep a heavenly perspective on earthly events. We will all do well to remember to do that. Amen? No matter what's happening, in our world, in our community, in our nation, we must remember that heaven is in control. This vision clearly portrays God's majesty and sovereignty over all created things, nature, human beings, and angels. John sees all of them collectively worshiping the one who sits on the throne and the lamb who was slain. Such worshipful adoration of God by all creation is the ultimate goal of redemption. And this vision is something persecuted Christians will want to keep before them. So let's, having given that introduction, let's go into the text itself. I'm going to read beginning in Revelation chapter 4. I'll pause for a comment or two along the way. But mostly we're going to read the text. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before me spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the Spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow, Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. 
Let me pause there and just make reference to these 24 thrones. So the idea that is being conveyed here is the absolute majesty and grandeur that is almost, well, it's breathtaking to John. And he labors to find words to describe what he sees. He puts it in the best language that he can find to convey his absolute sense of being overwhelmed by this majesty of God. And one of the things that makes the throne of God even more grand is that there are 24 other thrones, lesser thrones, that surround it, uh, probably in a circle with his throne at the center and exalted high above all. And he tells us that there are 24 elders who sit on these thrones. The identity of these, these elders is something we can only speculate because he doesn't tell us who they are. But many believe that they really are representative of both the Old and New Testament church combined. It's possible, some have suggested, that 12 represent the uh, 12 sons of Jacob or uh, the tribes of Israel. More likely, they represent maybe great leaders of the Old Testament church, such as Abraham and Moses and David and Elijah and so forth. We don't know who they are, but uh, they, they definitely represent both the Old and the New Testament. It's possible that the other 12 would represent the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Um, at any rate, remember that apocalyptic literature uses word pictures. It uses symbols to convey truth. And so we are not necessarily to take this literally as if John took a snapshot with a camera of the actual heavenly throne room. He says, I'm in the spirit. And he's seeing things that are being shown to him in the spirit that are intended to convey truth, not necessarily to give us an exact graphic idea of what the throne of God will actually be like when we get there someday. And we definitely understand that when we get to looking at these, these uh, seraphim, the living creatures, and that's in verse 6. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third human face. The fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Now, if, if again, if you were to try to take this literally, it's almost grotesque. It, it is phantasmagoric. It, uh, it, you know, it's not a pleasant image. Six wings with eyes all over them. So please... Don't try to understand that in a literal way, but take the symbolism and ask, what does it mean? What's it trying to tell us? And I believe what it's telling us, these living creatures with the four different representations of animate life, to me, suggests that all of the created order is focused on worshiping the Creator. And the eyes all over that look in every direction at the same time suggest to us the omniscience of God. God sees all. God knows all. These beings are a part of His throne. And so while they represent the created order, they also represent something to us of the, uh, the, the, the power and the, the, uh, the uh, attributes of deity, which omniscience is certainly one of those. All of those seeing eyes that look in every direction simultaneously. Verse 8 says, each of these living beings had six wings, and we talked about that. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was and who is and who is still to come. So these seraphim are worshiping the thrice holy God. Uh, it's not difficult to see the Trinity represented here. Holy, holy, holy. It also suggests to us that holiness is God's primary moral attribute. 
They are not saying loving, 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 or merciful, merciful, merciful. They are saying holy, holy, holy. And I suggest to you that out of His holiness flow all of the other beautiful moral attributes of God. He loves us because He is holy. He is merciful toward us because He is holy. He is immutable, meaning He will never change. And He will never change His mind about us because He is holy. He's faithful to us because He is holy. So we should never think of the holiness of God as something uh, to shy away from or to be, you know, fearful over in the wrong sense of the word fear there, but to see it as something so wonderful, so beautiful that we want to emulate that and be like Him. And He tells us, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And it's a wonderful thing because if I am truly holy, then I will treat my wife the way a husband should treat his wife. Amen? Holiness produces beautiful, beautiful attributes, love, mercy, and so forth. So the, the worship is going on in the throne, and that is the, uh, the, the occupation, you could say the preoccupation of heaven is the worship of this living God who draws praise to himself the way the rays of the sun draw moisture from the ocean. He is just worthy. He is worthy. He evokes praise. In verse 9 we read, Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. I prefer the King James Version reading of that, which says, You created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. You know why we are here? For his pleasure. Amen. He's not here for our pleasure. He's not here <laughs> to make us happy. We are here for his pleasure. He is pleased with us because he loved us, he created us, and so forth. And so that's that's chapter four. And uh, at the end of it, the elders, these 24 circling the throne, fall down before him, prostrate, and they take their crowns and lay them before him as if to say, anything that I have done that brings any honor to me whatsoever, I lay it at the feet of the only one who is worthy of praise and honor. And then we move into chapter 5. Pastor. Yes, sir. In uh, chapter 4, do you have any notes or any thoughts on four beasts and their correlation to the four beasts in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel's vision? Yeah, they're, they're probably the same. Gotcha. Um, in fact, I was just reading a book uh, in preparation for this, written by two Jewish rabbis who are students of Ezekiel and Revelation. And they point out that the writer of Revelation was also a student of Ezekiel. Um, in the sense that we see similar imagery in Revelation that we see in Ezekiel, as with Daniel also, but especially Ezekiel. And yet there's enough differentiation as to make us know that each saw their own vision. In other words, John wasn't just copying something that Ezekiel had written, but he saw something so similar to what Ezekiel had seen that when he records it, it, it almost reads as a parallel to what he had seen. So a very good observation there. <coughs> Chapter 5. Then, John says, I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll. It wasn't unusual in ancient times for scrolls to be written on both sides because parchment or vellum, whatever it was, the material was very scarce and very valuable, and so they used every little square inch of it they could. It says it was sealed with seven seals, 
And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. Just a word here about the weeping. John didn't mean here that he had a tear roll down his cheek. He is in the agony of grief that is so overwhelming to him uh, that he's sobbing. That's the, probably the way we'd put it in our vernacular. He just broke down and sobbed. He melted under the agony of grief of knowing that man's estate is forever lost to him. And he says in verse 5, But one of the twenty-four elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now why is he called the lion of the tribe of Judah? Well, we know the Old Testament said that the scepter will not pass out of Judah. Judah is the Lord's lawgiver. Uh, it was the tribe of Judah that God chose to rule Israel. David, of course, being of the tribe of Judah and Jesus being the son of David. But when John looks, he says he saw a lamb, not a lion. A lamb. And it was a lamb as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. Jesus will forever bear the marks of of his suffering throughout eternity. Judy. Jerry, I, I remember the thought of him weeping that he had gone through so much. I mean, he had been on the island of Patmos and could it just all of a sudden when he saw that has it, has it been worth it? Yeah. Is it senseless? No, it was just a hopelessness. I think, yeah, that's a good point. After all of his suffering, the persecution that he'd been through, the privation, the everything, and then to get to the end, and it's all for nothing. Yeah, I'm sure that added to, to his sorrow and, and brokenness. Absolutely. And so Jesus is seen here, that, represented by the Lamb, Again, symbols. And it was common in Jewish apocalyptic literature to use animals to convey truth. Often humans are pictured as a particular kind of animal. And when you know something about those animals, it helps you understand some character traits of the person that is representing. Example, uh, what are the character traits of a lamb? What are the character traits of a lion? In chapter 13, we will meet someone referred to as the beast. What are the character traits of a beast? And that helps you understand some things about the personality, temperament, and the nature of the one who is being represented by these uh, animal figures. Notice it says the, the, the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Now again, if you try to make this literal, it's grotesque. Who, who wants to see a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes on it? That's a freak. But that's not the point. Understand the literature. What does the seven horns mean? Well, we know what seven is. It's the number of completeness, perfection. The horn in Jewish in, in antiquity represented strength. You think about it. They were an agricultural society, and the horns of an ox, the horns of a bull, the horns of a ram represents strength, great strength. So what this is basically representing is that the Lamb of God, though He is meek as a lamb, He is omnipotent as a lion. Strength, perfect strength, seven horns. Seven eyes, again, omniscience. He sees all, He knows all. These are the attributes of deity, aren't they? Omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. But it also mentions that the seven eyes represent the seven spirits of God. And we saw that the first time we met uh, from Isaiah chapter 11. That's a reference to the seven beautiful character traits of the Holy Spirit. Again, don't try to over-literalize it. 
just take the symbols and learn what they're telling us about. The, the lamb here is one who is filled with the Spirit, anointed with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, as well as being omniscient. Verse 7, he stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings, these are the seraphim who are crying, holy, 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 the four living beings and the 24 elders, again, fall down before the Lamb, just as they did in chapter 4 before the one sitting on the throne. Now they do the same thing. They pay the same kind of, 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 of worship and adoration toward the Lamb. And it says, um, they, they each had a harp and they each held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. What are the harps and the bowls? It's praise and prayer, isn't it? Why do we sing on Sunday mornings when we gather? Why do we begin our worship services with music, with singing to the Lord? Well, because the Lord tells us to. It's all over. Psalms, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Amen? We, we don't sing just because we enjoy music. We sing because He enjoys music. We sing to Him. He, he loves it. He delights in it. And, uh, and so these 24 elders have harps and they have bowls and that's intercession. And we'll see that later in, in uh, Revelation. The, the, the incense in those bowls is the prayers of intercession. They fall down before the Lamb uh, and they sang a new song. A new song. Why is it called a new song? Well, because the angels have been singing an old song throughout eternity. But this is the song of the elders. In fact, it is the song of the redeemed. It's a song the angels cannot sing. And let's look at it. These are the words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Then I looked again and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders and they sang in a mighty chorus. All right, we've seen the song of the redeemed, but now the angels chime in, and this is the song of the redeemed and of the angels. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then... He says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. And they all sang. This is the song of creation. We heard the song of the redeemed. We heard the angels chime in with their part. And now all of created life joins in the cacophony of praise and adds their wording here, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Jesus is going to be the focus of our worship and our adoration throughout the ages of eternity. He is going to be the centerpiece of heaven. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God slain. You don't, need an interpretation. you don't need an interpretation. It's clear. Amen. And, and so uh, to that point, George, this is not something that just was going on for that moment when John saw it and then heaven moves on to other things. Uh, it is going to be the, uh, the unceasing preoccupation of heaven to glorify the Lord. Now we will serve Him and we will be engaged, I believe, in lots of extending the kingdom of God to the reaches of the universe uh, according to his will and plan. I don't understand. I don't claim to have a fix on all that we're going to be doing, but I don't believe we're going to be sitting on clouds playing harps for eternity. But certainly praise and adoration is going to be the theme of heaven. Praise the Lord. And then the last verse, verse 14 says, 
And the four living beings said, this is the most used word in Hebrew, in the Hebrew language. Amen. Amen. And what that means is, what has just been said is veritable, stable, solid, unequivocal truth. It is true. Amen. Powerful word. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. This is unequivocal evidence that the Bible teaches the deity of Jesus Christ. If you ever hear anybody tell you, well, the Bible doesn't claim that Jesus is God or that he is deity, take them to this verse because only deity is worthy of worship. In fact, we will meet elders in the book of Revelation that John falls down in front of and starts to worship and the elder stops him. No, don't worship me. I'm just one of your fellow servants. Don't worship me, worship God. But Jesus receives worship because he is God. Amen. So that's that heavenly throne room vision in chapters four and five. And then we come to chapters 6 and 7, and we're going to see some activity on earth that is initiated by events that are happening in heaven. Uh, two simultaneous movements on earth. Before I, I read that, let me just read the little paragraph in front of that. From this point forward, the plot line of Revelation alternates between actions in heaven and events on earth. So all through the rest of the book, you're going to be caught up into heaven and then taken back down to earth. And you'll see that what happens in heaven affects what happens on earth. And so this continual undulating, alternating action serves as a reminder that heaven has ultimate control over the events on earth. So it's like a pattern woven all through the book of Revelation that reminds us God's in control. Hallelujah. There are two simultaneous movements that will be taking place on earth during the Great Tribulation period. And they are there in opposition, as we shall see. Chapter 6 opens a section of Revelation that deals primarily with the Tribulation, a seven-year period of great calamity and judgment, also known as Daniel's 70th week. Let me pause right there and just say, in the book of Daniel, Daniel sees a vision or an angel visits him and tells him certain things that are coming upon his people, the, the Jewish people. And he says, 70 weeks are determined for your people. And he tells Daniel what's going to happen in the first 69 of those weeks. But then the 70th week is kind of left a little bit ambiguous and is not yet fulfilled. Um, those weeks are actually weeks of years, just as there are seven days in a week. This refers to seven years in each week. So that's one of the places in the Bible where we get this notion of a seven year tribulation period, the week of years. There are other places where it's very clear that we're talking about a seven year period. Um, and uh, it is primarily focused on Israel. It is the 70th week of Daniel relating to the Jewish people. So the, remember this, the great tribulation, not the great tribulation necessarily, but the tribulation, there's a little distinction between those two, as we shall see. But the tribulation, one of God's primary purposes for it is to wrap up his dealings with his people Israel and restore them to their Messiah. And that will be one of the great outcomes of this tribulation period. Um, the tribulation will result in that, the restoration of the nation of Israel to the Messiah, and will bring God's final judgments on unrepentant humanity. These divine judgments come in three series of seven, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. We're going to talk about the seven seals tonight. Dreadful as they are, these judgments are true and righteous. That is, they are God's appropriate and righteous response to man's unrepented sin. It seems that God provides merciful pauses between some of these judgments in the hope that people will repent and turn to Him. Yet four times we are told they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or sexual immorality or their 
thefts. So in spite of the judgments, there is no repentance. Chapter 6 and 7 appear to be summaries of two major movements that occur all throughout the tribulation and they're going on simultaneously with each other. Now that's my interpretation, okay? Others may not see it this way. I told you in the beginning, don't try to make everything in Revelation sequential or chronological because there are parenthetical chapters and there are chapters that summarize what is about to come. And I think that's the case with chapters six and seven. Um, these two movements are in conflict with each other. The first movement is man's rebellious attempt to rule the planet without God. We're going to see that in the rule of the Antichrist. The second is God's redemptive activity in saving the remnant. And so let's look at um, the first of these in chapter six, where we encounter these seven seals. Now the seven seals, of course, refer to those wax stamps that sealed the scroll that is now held by the Lamb. As Jesus breaks each one of those seals in heaven, a corresponding event occurs to advance God's kingdom purpose on earth. These seven events appear to be a broad summary of the entire tribulation period covered in chapters 6 through 18. Therefore, the seven seals would include the seven trumpet and bowl judgments. And let me just put up here on this. By the way, you have a copy of this, the last page of your notes. And I just want to give you a concept. And again, this is my interpretation. Please don't take this to the bank. And don't argue anybody down that this is the only way to interpret it, okay? For example, many believe that the rapture will end the church age because the church will be taken out of the world at that point, thus ending the church age, which is represented in chapters 2 and 3 with those seven letters to the seven churches. But there are others who believe the rapture will come somewhere midway through the tribulation, and then still others who believe that the rapture and the second coming will happen simultaneously with each other at the end of the tribulation. We call these pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Somebody said, well, I'm pan-trib. I believe it's all going to pan out all right. <laughs> Pat Robertson believes in a post-tribulation rapture. And I have great respect for him. And uh, I would not debate or argue this point. It's not worth it. And I'll say this, I want to live as if I'm ready, whatever happens, okay? I think one of the reasons the Jewish people missed their Messiah when he came is they had it all figured out. And it was going to happen this way. He was going to come on a white stallion and he was going to be a conquering hero that would take the, 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 the heel of Rome off of them and all of that. Well, he didn't come that way. He came on a donkey, didn't he? Humble, as a suffering servant. So I don't want to get so adamant and so absolute in the way I think this is going to happen that I miss it. And I believe that we should be prepared, if God so wills, that we will endure or we will be martyred in the tribulation. That we God will give us grace to go through that. But I'd like to hope, and I do believe there is scriptural evidence for a pre-trib rapture. But I, again, I'm not an absolutist of that. But let's say that this area here represents the tribulation. And we're talking seven years. So obviously this is not the scale because the church age has so far lasted almost 2,000 years, okay? But seven years here, we'll, we'll put that. And this is the areas, uh, the, the, the span of time that's covered in chapters 6 through 18. What I want to propose to you is that the seven seals that we're about to read regarding, um, and that's in chapter. 6, 1 through chapter 8 to 2 um, span the entire seven year 
period. And I'll explain that to you when we get into it in just a moment. So let's, let's, uh, let's go look at that. And uh, then we'll also see how this um, salvation of the remnant figures into that. So look back in your notes. The first four of the seals are the infamous four horsemen of the apocalypse. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. The first of these, the rider on the white horse, should not be confused with the white horse rider that we will meet over in chapter 19, which is the second coming when Jesus returns the end of the tribulation period. He is seen riding on a white horse. I believe this first horseman of the apocalypse is none other than the imposter, uh, the Antichrist. He seeks world dominion. His, the fact that he's on a white horse suggests that he comes in peace and goodwill, but that is only a ruse. He is seeking conquest. He is given a crown. He rides forth as a conqueror bent on conquest. Chapter 6, verse 2. Following him are the other three, representing war, the red horse, famine, the black horse, and death, the pale green horse. Very suggestive of the malignant fruit of Antichrist's reign. We'll meet Antichrist again in chapter 13 where John depicts him as a monstrous beast gaining global control. These four horsemen and the mayhem they unleash suggest the catastrophic nature of the tribulation period. And that's one reason that I see them stretching throughout this tribulation time because it is going to be a time of conquest and war and famine and death over and over again that's going to play out throughout those seven years but bear in mind that by breaking the seals Jesus himself is the one releasing these four horsemen and here I quote this Jewish rabbi that I mentioned earlier from the book Hebrew insights from Revelation he says while horrible things will soon come to test all the believers, none of them would happen without God's knowledge and command. They cannot move by themselves, referring to the four horsemen. They are under God's complete authority. So the lesson here is that for a season, God will allow man to have his way and to reap the ultimate tragic consequences of humanism which humanism is man's attempt to run things without God, in a nutshell. And that's what we're going to see during this much of this tribulation period, man having his way and the awful fruit of that. So having set that stage, let's go read it now in chapter 6. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a loud voice like thunder, Come! Come, loud voice like thunder. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come! Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. Remember, symbols, symbols, read the symbols. When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come, I looked up and saw a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and wine. That's inflation. That is just virulent in inflation where your entire day's wage goes to buy a loaf of bread. Seven, verse seven, when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named death and his companion was the grave. Hebrew there is Sheol. The Greek is Hades. It refers to the dark underworld the holding tank for the souls departed until judgment day. 
So death and Sheol. These two were given authority over one fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, famine and disease and wild animals. So all of this will be going on during that seven year tribulation. And in verse nine, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. Now he's still in heaven. Remember, John has been taken up into this heavenly throne room. And there's an altar there before the throne of God. He said, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. In other words, all of those up to that point throughout the ages are included in this. And he says, they shouted to the Lord. This is their prayer. O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? So it's a prayer for God to avenge. Listen, it is not wrong to avenge. God says, vengeance is mine. He doesn't say vengeance is wrong. He says, vengeance is mine. What's wrong about vengeance is when I decide to avenge myself. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and He is going to avenge. He's going to bring justice, isn't He? That's what they're asking for. Not so much that they want to get back at people, but that they want justice for their righteous cause. Verse 11, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. Now listen. These are the souls who have been martyred up until this point in time, but here is a clear reference that there are going to be more martyrs to come, and we're going to meet them in the next chapter. So just make a little mental note there, put a little stake down there, because when we get to chapter uh, 7, we're going to see a reference back to that. <clears throat> Verse 12, I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Now I believe and again, my interpretation, this is the, um, the sixth seal. And so we would expect that it would be coming somewhere close to the end of this period. And I believe that what we are reading here in the description of these events associated with the sixth seal correspond to the seventh bowl judgment. The idea being that within these seven seals are contained the seven trumpet and bowl judgments and we're seeing the outplay of the last of those bowl judgments here. Let me take you over to chapter 16 if you want to flip over in your Bible to there. Chapter 16 verse 17. <clears throat> Then the seventh angel, okay, let me just set the stage. You've got the seven seals, and within them you have seven trumpet judgments. That's seven angels with trumpets, and every time they sound a trumpet, another judgment is poured out. This is the divine wrath of God on the world. And then following those seven trumpet judgments are the seven bowl judgments where the angels pour out the wrath of God is pictured. Oftentimes the wrath of God is pictured as a cup full of wrath that's about to tip over and pour out. And we see that in these seven bold judgments. Now bearing in mind what we just read in the sixth seal, let's read in chapter 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple saying, It's finished! Then the thunder crashed and rolled and lightning flashed and a great earthquake struck. Remember we just read about the sixth seal that a great earthquake 
And it says, the worst since people were placed on the earth, the great city of Babylon split into three sections and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. Every island disappeared, all the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm, hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky on the people below. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. And so you have all of this calamity and chaos going on. And go back now to chapter 6, and I want to continue reading about this sixth seal. goes on to say, verse 15, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, and they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and, the, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive. So here we have the sixth seal and the generals and kings are together. Why do you think they have come together? For Armageddon. They are converging to fight. It's, it's so absolutely foolhardy. But you know, when you turn away from God, He gives you over to do stupid things. And there's nothing more stupid than fighting the living God. But the Bible says they'll converge there in the Valley of Jezreel in northern Israel. And, uh, and, and I think they'll come together to fight other nations. There's a possibility that they'll fight nations from the Far East, China, and so forth. So it'll be the East and West conflict, but then they'll all turn on the Lamb when He returns as King of Kings. And these generals and kings cry out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for their, the time of their wrath has come. <clears throat> to me, that is very graphic description of what's going to happen at the second coming when Jesus returns and fights the battle of Armageddon with the sword of his mouth and destroys kings and generals and armies with the sword that comes forth from his mouth, his word. So I, that's another reason why I see these seven seals as just stretching all the way across the, the seven year period. Uh, makes sense to me there. Um, <clears throat> now, we come to the final part that we're going to look at tonight, and that's chapter seven. And this is that second movement. We talked about two great movements that are in conflict with each other, that are happening simultaneously during the seven year period. The one is the one we've just described, the seven seals and all of the catastrophe and calamity uh, revolving around uh, not only the rule of the Antichrist, but the outpouring of the wrath of God. That's going on. But while that's going on, God is up to something. Something else is happening. And, and it is a, a great revival movement. Let's look at it in your notes. While these catastrophic a strat <laughs> Let's get it right. It's easy for me to say. While these catastrophic events are occurring, another movement is also underway, a major spiritual revival that will sweep millions into the kingdom of God. This revival begins with the sealing of 144,000 Messianic Jews who become missionaries to the nations of the world. Hal Lindsey refers to them as 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams. As a result of this spirit-empowered missionary activity, millions of Gentiles from all over the world will come to faith in Christ. Due to severe persecution from the Antichrist regime, many of these new believers will suffer torture and martyrdom for their faith. And so um, let's read that first part of uh, chapter 7. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now the seventh seal hasn't been opened yet. We've had six, but there's a pause. Seventh isn't opened yet. We'll see that later in chapter eight. We won't get there tonight. Um, when I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree, 
I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying the seal of the living God. And he shouted, and this is a different kind of seal now, this is the, the ring seal that makes the image in the wax. And he's going to seal these 144,000. He says, wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. And I heard how many were marked with the seal, 144,000. And they were from the tribes of Israel. Twelve tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. You see them listed there if you have your Bible open. And so that's the sealing of these Jewish Billy Grahams who are going to be missionaries empowered by the Holy Spirit who will be carrying on missionary activity around the world in spite of all of the horrific activity that we've just been seeing in the seven seal uh, judgments. And as a result of their activity, the very next scene John sees is the fruit of their labor. And that's this vast crowd. And you have it in your notes there in uh, beginning in verse, um, verse uh, 9, I believe. Let me see. Yeah. Verse 9, After this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And then one of the 24 elders asked John, who are these, this multitude of people? And John confesses his ignorance, so the elder answers his own question, beginning in verse 14. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That's why they stand in front of God's throne and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will give them shelter. These are those martyrs that we were told about in the previous chapter that have to be martyred before God can bring the vengeance that He's going to bring for all of the martyrs. And a clue that they are martyrs is verse 16. They'll never again be hungry, thirsty. They'll never be scorched by the heat of the sun. The Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. All their suffering, all of their persecution, all of their martyrdoms will be wiped away. Hallelujah. By their shepherd. Praise God. So, some terrible things happening, but also some wonderful things happening. And so what we put up here is the salvation of the remnant. And that's chapter 7, 31 through 17. And that, like the sea, simultaneous parallel all through the tribulation period as I understand the scripture. Okay, let me just close with this word. The multitude saved out of every nation, tribe, people, and language is the fulfillment of the mission of God on this earth. What uh, missiologists refer to as the Missio Dei, which we often call the Great Commission. It is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. When He first called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, He made a number of promises to him. And that call is repeated multiple times throughout the book of Genesis and the story of Abraham. And there is one common denominator in all of them. This is the one thing He says in each of those, though they also have other promises, but the one promise that is consistent I will make you a blessing to all of the nations, all of the families of the earth. And this suggests to us that God has always had a heart for the nations. Imagine His joy over this vast, diverse family that will own Him as their Redeemer. So may we also rejoice in this vision and join God in His mission to disciple the nations. Amen. That is the work of redemption that we are a part of.
We are blessed to be a part of it. Praise the Lord. The Great Commission wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something that was first mentioned in Matthew 28. It, it goes all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis. It's always been God's heart to save the nations. Amen. Praise God. And so in chapter 7, we see that beautiful fulfillment, that vision of, of that wonderful fruit. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for inspiring John to write this book for us. And Lord, even though we may be missing it here and there, we may not have every detail just right, and we certainly don't claim to have the timeline just right. These are just options and scenarios, and to some extent speculations. And yet we know that underlying all of that are deeper realities the majesty and the glory of your rule, the adoration and worship of all the created order along with all of the, the angels that will praise you throughout eternity and the Lamb of God slaughtered for our salvation will be the centerpiece of that worship. And Lord, that all of the events that happen on this earth and things have got to get bad before they can get better, but all of that is under your control. Thank you for these truths. Let us take these things home with us, Lord. These grand truths and the fact that the ultimate goal is that the nations of the earth will praise you and worship you throughout eternity. We join in that praise. We give our, our volitional, willing, joyous praise along with theirs. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.